Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, Ottawa spells out how and when fully vaccinated tourists can visit Canada. So this is uh, freedom, freedom. But it may be one way only at the Canada-US border. Also tonight, the UK drops its remaining COVID-19 restrictions. I want to have a good time, hon. Some say it's too soon for Freedom Day. Unprecedented choice. Meet Canada's Olympic flag bearers. It's a massive honor to have been asked to do this. I feel so honored. And prepping for Tokyo through a pandemic. This journey makes you really connect on a really deep level. There's no other better word, I think, than family. Andrew talks with Canada's top-ranked beach volleyballers. This is The National. With COVID cases coming down and vaccination rates going up, this country will soon take a big step towards how things were before the pandemic. For the first time in well over a year, tourists will be allowed to visit. It will start in just a few weeks, first with Americans, then the rest of the world. Tonight, we'll look at how it will work in practice and why some are concerned about what it might mean for COVID in this country. Today's announcement is being welcomed, though, by those waiting anxiously to visit friends and family here in Canada. Ashley Burke walks us through the details of the plan and how, so far, the United States is not returning the favour. After more than a year locked down, Canada's opening its border back up to international travellers, starting with the U.S. On August 9th, we will be opening non-essential travel to Americans who've been fully vaccinated for at least 14 days. This is in recognition of our unique bond. That means no two-week quarantine, but travellers will be required to show proof they've received Health Canada-approved vaccines and must test negative pre-departure, but will no longer face a test upon arrival in Canada unless randomly selected. We've been anxiously waiting. This fully vaccinated couple who live in New York State plan to drive across the border on day one of reopening, a visit to finally reunite with Canadian family and friends. So this is uh, freedom, freedom. Unvaccinated children under 12 will also no longer have to quarantine for two weeks, but there are restrictions and it's unclear how strictly it will be enforced. They can accompany their parent or guardian out of the house to their destination so long as they avoid group settings like summer camps, school or childcare for 14 days. As far as I'm concerned, those restrictions are a small price to pay to have the opportunity to, to come home. Andrew Boggs lives in the UK with his family. His son has only met his Canadian grandparents and relatives once due to quarantine rules. But that's about to change. It's been so long, and, and especially for my little boy, so much of his engagement with his relatives is, is tactile, as being able to be with them and, and touch them. And, and not having that for so long. Sorry. <clears throat> But some experts argue reopening the border with the Delta variant on the rise is a risk. Given that only 50% of the Canadian population is protected, uh, what might happen in Canada is a, a fourth wave, and a fourth wave of infection, especially in those that are not fully protected. The U.S. says it isn't ready to reopen its border to Canada yet. We are continuing to review our travel restrictions. And Ashley, what do we know about why the government's doing this now? Well, Ian, Canada has surpassed the U.S. for the percentage of the population fully vaccinated. Officials say that that plus the decline in cases is why it's moving forward with this reopening. But political watchers point to the possibility of an election call and being able to run on a campaign of one or more steps toward normalcy might be advantageous and could help shield against criticism for calling it during a pandemic. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. And here's another sign of that loosening border. International passenger flights will return to five more Canadian airports, Halifax, Quebec City, Ottawa, Winnipeg and Edmonton. But that ban on direct flights coming from India will stay in place for now. While progress is being made, the situation in India is still very serious. Those restrictions have been extended another month. Public health officials say protecting Canadians from an increased spread of the Delta variant is driving their decision. More than 250 Canadian sailors are in a holding pattern tonight after one crew member of HMCS Halifax tested positive for COVID-19. 
The ship arrived in Halifax this morning. The military says the member is asymptomatic and in good health and it's not known how they contracted the virus. They've been isolated from the rest of the crew and no one else aboard has tested positive. They will all stay on the ship until a round of PCR tests clears everyone. The Ontario government says colleges and universities should prepare for business as usual this fall. That means in-person classes without capacity limits or physical distancing. But they also need to have backup plans in case of a COVID-19 outbreak. There will still be some flexibility to offer classes online and in hybrid models. In England, they lifted almost all of their COVID restrictions and called it Freedom Day. But as Salima Shivji tells us, the milestone was also marked with a surge in cases and a prime minister in isolation. A short countdown to a long-awaited opening. After 16 tough months, clubs are once again open in England with no restrictions. And the excitement can hardly be contained. If this looks packed to you, check out the lineup outside of all the people wanting in. I've had my vaccines. I want to have a good time, hard. It's felt like a dream. Like, I feel like we've all waited for this moment for a long, long time. But the sense that this is freedom is more muted in other parts of London. Andy Iliff came to sign a heart in memory of the grandfather he lost to COVID. It's kind of this now or never type mentality, but it definitely feels like a, a risk. Others are also wishing the government had moved more slowly. Everywhere we've been today, there's been a lot of people, not many people wearing masks. So um, I don't think it's the right time yet. I think everybody needs to be cautious and a lot of people aren't. Hopefully it's just not too quick. Every single heart here represents a victim of COVID-19 and many doctors and scientists warn with virtually all restrictions now gone, there will be many more to add. Hospitalizations are inching up as coronavirus cases surge in the UK to levels not seen in months. Please, please, please. Be cautious. Boris Johnson, himself forced into isolation after his health minister tested positive, also forced to beam into his own briefing to both urge caution and defend the reopening. If not now, when? And though both deaths and hospitalizations, as I say, are sadly rising, these numbers are well within the margins of what our scientists predicted. He also announced nightclubs will have to check for proof of full vaccination before letting anyone in, just not until late September. A sign that the path to normal may not be as smooth as many are hoping. Salima Shivji, CBC News, London. Now let's turn to the Olympics, where just days away from the opening ceremony, Tokyo is still under a COVID state of emergency. But with that countdown underway, Japanese officials are mixing preparation with celebration. Today, in a careful ceremony, the public got to see previous torchbearers pass the flame back and forth one more time. Meanwhile, airports are getting busy as athletes continue to pour into the country. Some members of Team Canada are already on the ground. Today, the athletes learn they'll be led into the stadium on Friday by two of their teammates. Stephen D'Souza tells us who they are and why their selection is unprecedented. Heading into her third Olympics, Miranda Ayim is looking to lead Canada to gold. But first, she has the distinction of carrying the flag in the opening ceremony. I feel so honored to represent Team Canada and lead Team Canada in these opening ceremonies alongside Nate. Hiriyama, Nate is Nathan Hiriyama. The 33-year-old from Richmond, B.C. is a mainstay on Canada's men's rugby seven squad. For the first time, Canada will have two athletes from different sports as flag bearers. Definitely very surprised, but uh, just uh, I think my biggest reaction is just very honored. There's Rosie McLennan. This year, they'll walk into a much different Olympic atmosphere. Because of the pandemic, no fans are allowed into any of the venues. Despite strict protocols, there have already been a handful of athletes test positive in the village, but so far, Olympic officials aren't sounding the alarm. The numbers we're seeing are actually extremely low. They're probably lower than we expected to see, if anything. Given the uncertainty, it's not clear how many Canadians will actually march in the opening ceremony. We have, have left attendance um, up to the teams, and so the teams are making their own decision. It's a tremendous rush. It's like being carried by a wave. 
Bruce Kidd knows what these athletes will be missing. He competed as a distance runner for Canada in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. While he says the lack of fans is a loss, a year of competing during the pandemic has prepared these athletes. They've been through a lot and I would say psychologically they're ready for whatever happens. Both Ayim and Hirayama say they trust the protocols put in place. I feel very safe and um, know that we're going into um, a, a good environment. And they say after the trials of the last year that the games are happening at all is special. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. In the long history of the NHL, no player has ever publicly revealed they were gay. But today, a 19-year-old from Alberta made history. Luke Prokop is the first active player on an NHL contract to come out. Aaron Collins now on the young man behind the sport's milestone moment. Thacker shooting, blocked by Luke Prokop. Who Bravery on the ice, a given for Luke Prokop. It's why the defenseman was picked in the third round of last year's NHL draft. Well, today, the Nashville Predators prospect displayed a different kind of courage. With this post on Instagram, Prokop became the first openly gay player signed to an NHL contract. I'm accepting who I am. I want to live the way I want to, and I'm going to accept myself as a gay man. Prokop's decision, no surprise to his junior team, the Calgary Hitmen. He was the assistant captain of our hockey club for a reason, because he's a leader, he's full of character, and uh, nothing changes in my mind, nor should it. Across the NHL, the news was met with support, a sign that the culture of pro sport may be changing. Just last month, the first active NFL player came out as gay. I just want to take a quick moment to say that I'm gay. I've been meaning to do this for a while now, but I finally feel comfortable enough to get it off my chest. But change isn't coming quick enough for this former minor pro goalie. He came out as the first openly gay pro hockey player five years ago. And I haven't really seen it evolve to the point where it's a safe space for queer people to regularly play the sport, especially on the men's side of the sport. Still, Prokop's announcement turned heads at this Calgary arena. I saw the notification on my phone and it brought a huge smile to my face. This rink home to two LGBTQ plus rec hockey teams. One of their captains says today's announcement matters. Hockey has typically been a very hyper masculine sport and I think, you know, for people to look, just, you know, take a look and see how they can help change the culture of hockey and sport. Today was a big day off the ice for Luke Prokop. He hopes it will help him on the ice too, making his journey to the NHL a smoother one. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. As hundreds of wildfires continue to burn across Canada, air quality warnings now stretch from parts of British Columbia all the way to southern Quebec. A hazy sky was once again the norm over much of the prairies today as smoke continued to cloud the region. Smoke from fires in northwestern Ontario also made their way south, bringing a thick haze to Toronto. In fact, for a short time today, the city had the world's worst air quality. And some breaking news from the B.C. interior this hour. Nearly 200 properties have been ordered evacuated by the Osoyas Indian Band, with further evacuation alerts and orders expected to come as an aggressive wildfire is spreading in the Okanagan Valley. Officials say the fire grew from three hectares to more than 300 over the course of a few hours this afternoon. At least two communities in the area have declared local states of emergency. The RCMP says officers in both Osoyas and Oliver have been deployed to conduct evacuations. We'll be following this developing story on all of our CBC platforms through the night. Federal Green Party leader Annami Paul is no longer facing a non-confidence vote, but today she condemned what she calls feuding and fighting within her party. It is extremely hard to have your integrity questioned when you value it so much. It was very hard and remains very hard to be stripped of many of the tools that I need to be an effective leader. Paul says she considered packing it in but didn't want to let down those who elected her. She says now is the time for the party to focus on the next federal election, which could come soon. Another black federal employee is breaking her silence about her treatment on the job. Monica Agard says a senior colleague made a racist remark to her and that when she complained, no action was taken. Farah Morali has the story. 
Nearly two years later, it's a conversation Monica Agard still gets emotional recounting. And that's when he made his comment. We should go back to the good old days when we had slaves. And, and you pause for a second because it hits you. She alleges those words were spoken to her by a senior colleague no, at the Immigration and Refugee Board. When I talk about this, I get so distressed. And I don't know if it's not only the statement, but it's inaction that, that is, is doubly hurtful. She says the same colleague later went on to become her supervisor. That's when she filed a formal complaint. Agard alleges her concerns haven't been taken seriously by the IRB. To have no action or no consequences, I, I take it as this is how they see me. And in general, the black workers. It's not the first time black civil servants have spoken out about racism. In December, a group filed a proposed class action lawsuit against the federal government alleging discrimination. The damages that black workers have faced and continue to face, it's, it's real and it's ongoing, and black workers need help right now. In a recent court filing, the group is asking that the government create a fund immediately so that black federal employees can access specialized counseling. So there needs to be a unique approach to addressing the traumas that the workers have faced uh, as a result of systemic discrimination. In a statement to CBC News, the Immigration and Refugee Board says Agard's case is under review, adding that racism and discrimination in any form is unacceptable. Sometimes when you suffer, you think you suffer alone. And unless you hear someone else's story, then you know that you're not suffering alone. Agard has now joined the proposed class action suit. After 30 years as a public servant, she says it's time to push for a change. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. The National Council of Canadian Muslims has released 60 policy recommendations to combat hate and racism across the country. As we see daily attacks against our community members since London, much more needs to be done and it needs to be done now. Recommendations include criminal code amendments on hate crimes and a national fund for victims of Islamophobia. It comes in the wake of last month's attack in London, Ontario. Police say four members of a Muslim family were targeted and killed by a driver. A Florida man has become the first person to be sent to jail for his part in January's storming of the Capitol in Washington. Paul Hodgkins was sentenced to eight months in prison after pleading guilty to obstructing an official proceeding. He was one of thousands of pro-Trump rioters who took part. More than 500 have been charged. The U.S. and an unusually broad coalition that includes Canada, the EU and NATO are accusing China of international cyber espionage. As Chris Reyes tells us, it's about that Microsoft hack earlier this year that breached thousands of accounts, some belonging to Canadians. The U.S. and its allies issuing a unified condemnation of China and claiming it helped hackers attack Microsoft early this year. My understanding is that the Chinese government, not unlike the Russian government, is not doing this themselves, but are protecting those who are doing it. Global Affairs Canada said their officials are confident China is responsible for the attacks, adding they believe hackers can easily access other Canadian networks. The UK foreign minister called China's actions reckless and systematic. Stern statements, but so far no sanctions against China, like the ones lobbied by the U.S. against Russia early this year for cyber attacks. Hi, everyone. The White House said that doesn't mean they're not taking the threats seriously. We are actually elevating and taking uh, steps to not only speak out publicly, uh, but certainly uh, uh, take action. One of those actions, formal charges from the U.S. Department of Justice against four Chinese nationals, three of them government officials. There have been many reports about cybercrime recently, but this prosecution is unique. This case is about a cyber hacking and economic espionage campaign led by the government of China. Bryce Westlake researches cybercrime at San Jose State University. He says there is a growing trend of government-sponsored hacking. Gone are the days where you had a spy living in a country, or at least that's not your primary way. Uh, now it's easier to develop your own hacking team within your country. A battleground for the digital age without bombs or bullets. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York.
Museums across the country are grappling with how to present a more complete picture of Canada's history. We have a duty to tell those stories and we want to make sure that we tell them correctly. Up next, what those exhibits could look like. Plus, they spent the pandemic a country apart. Now they're days away from competing together at the Olympics. It's the longest we've ever gone, away from each other and away from the sport. None of our other competitors really were away from their teammates. Canada's beach volleyball duo talks about their reunion on the world stage. And later, meet a different kind of Olympic team. It's Canada's other hockey. You're Canadian playing hockey. And then you mentioned field hockey. And usually you get a bit of a laugh in your face. Why they're ready to prove you wrong. We're back in two. Welcome back. First Nations representatives called out the provincial government in Manitoba today while laying out an action plan against racism. Elected officials who continue to rest on the laurels of archaic policy and legislation that was developed in racism. The summit of Treaty 5 sovereign nations accused the Manitoba government of spreading, quote, racist political propaganda. They want the newly appointed Indigenous Reconciliation Minister to resign after he said residential school officials thought they were doing the right thing. As Canada reckons with its treatment of Indigenous peoples, cultural institutions are examining their role in presenting Canada's history. Eli Glasner shows us how and where that conversation is happening. The new CEO of the RCMP Heritage Centre has a big job. Well, the museum has not been updated for several years. The Heritage Minister has promised millions of dollars, but with conditions. Speaking with the Globe and Mail, Stephen Gobeau said, The museum dedicated to the history of the RCMP would have to tell the full story, and not from some glorified version. That includes the role the RCMP played taking Indigenous children to residential schools. We have a duty to tell those stories, and we want to make sure that we tell them correctly and in a really meaningful way so that there can be education. Tara Robinson says the centre will be consulting intensively with the Indigenous community. I am learning and that that'll be part of this process for the team here as well. And I think for the nation too, I think there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. Across Canada, many museum officials are re-examining their roles. Museums by nature are, are kind of antiquated. Here you see um, a shoe. At the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the witness blanket is the centerpiece of a new gallery exploring the history of residential schools through actual objects. Can you imagine who, who's, who wore the shoe? Um, there's pieces of doorways, there's a piece of, of a braid of hair, and every single one of those pieces, and we don't call them artifacts per se, right, because they're, they're linked to a story. She says finding an emotional and accurate way to tell our nation's story is something many institutions are grappling with. I don't just think it, I know it, because I'm part of some of those conversations, are really looking at how we do our work. And, and you know, if we're public institutions, so we're only as relevant to the public as the public can see themselves in us. This is an opportunity. Kerry Newman created the witness blanket. We got a young fellow that was small, he could crawl in here. His father, seen here, is a residential school survivor. Although he calls himself an optimist, he wonders if the RCMP museum will go far enough. I hope that it isn't limited to residential schools, because we heard stories in making the witness blanket of the knock at the door. He says true healing now can only come from a true accounting of the past. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead, the pandemic upended their Olympic training and momentum. I was angry, I was sad, I was confused. How Canada's beach volleyball champions are making up for lost time. But first... What's the shocking part is what's out there, what we don't know. Understanding the stories behind the recent discoveries near Saskatchewan's former Marival Residential School.
Welcome back. Recent discoveries have sparked a national conversation about the trauma of Canada's former residential schools. Just last month, Saskatchewan's Cowessis First Nation announced it had located 751 unmarked graves. Now, Jorge Barrera has surprising new details on who might lie there based on oral history and Catholic Church records. Yeah, this is all original graveyard. Lloyd Lara knows many of the stories that ended in this cemetery on the Calasas First Nation. These were all headstones, like all the way up. It sat next to the Maravel Residential School, where Lara attended as a child and later worked as an administrator when Ottawa and the band took it over. Yeah, well, the trees are in the way, but if you take a look at this white building here, then if you go, if you went straight across, that would have been where, like, the residence was. This all was once part of a Catholic mission, founded in the late 1880s by the Oblates Order. Ground penetrating radar work on this site recently identified 751 unmarked graves. This is a Roman Catholic grave site. It's not a residential school grave site. Calvis's chief Cadmus Delorme says it remains unclear how many residential school children lie buried here? From the oral stories that I was told so far, from what I know, 75% um, are, um, you know, Maryville Residential School um, um, children, like 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 what that one at Maryville. But um, I I can't confirm that. 75% would mean more than 500 children are buried here. The announcement from Cowessis came on the heels of a smaller but similar find on the grounds of a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. They shook a nation still coming to grips with the darkest part of its history and the thousands of indigenous children who never came home. But on Cowessis First Nation, there is an ease about blurring unknown residential school deaths with the cemetery. The older ones knew that it, it wasn't all children in there. Some say the story here is different. All they had to do was ask the older generation mm -hmm. first before they went public to really find out what happened, you know. And uh, there wouldn't have been that big of a I don't know what the word would be, hullabaloo, I guess. Linda Whiteman and her sister, Pearl Lara, attended Maryville from the late 1940s to the 1950s. They say this is not like what was found on the grounds of Kamloops Residential School, where ground-penetrating radar discovered evidence of 200 buried children in an old apple orchard. Here in Cowessis, this is a known cemetery. There was a mixture of everyone in that graveyard, in that cemetery. Our great-grandparents are buried there, our grandparents are buried there, and our parents are buried there. Families outside the First Nation also buried people here. It was the surrounding farmers and the beaches, and on the north side of the river there was a Métis community, and they had people buried as well in our cemetery. Most of the flags marking possible human remains are in the oldest section of the cemetery, where a priest in the early 1960s removed all the headstones, creating uncertainty as to who is buried here and where. Lloyd Laurent saw it happen. He said they used a one-ton truck to push and carry the headstones away. We were in school and then we came out and there was all kind of activity going on there. But why the headstones disappeared remains part of the mystery. Some say they were removed by a priest in a dispute with the band. Others said it was because the markers were crumbling and the grave sites sinking in. So the priest at that time basically informed all the parishioners and people that had loved ones in there that they better come and clean it up. But uh, not enough parishioners. So he decided just... The work to identify the graves without headstones began a few years ago. LaRosse said there are four mission registry volumes. CBC News obtained the index and several pages from the registry's first volume, covering baptisms, marriages, and burials from 1885 to 1933. There are about 450 burials recorded during this period. 
CBC News managed to determine the ages in 184 of the burials up to the year 1908. 94 of them were either preschool aged or died at birth. The rest range in age from the very young to the very old. The records show that at least two school aged children were buried here after the residential school opened in 1898. But this is only a partial record. The Catholic Church holds all the documents that would reveal how many children buried in this cemetery died at the residential school. There's a lot of flags out there <clears throat> and a lot of them are outside the original boundary of the graveyard. It's these markers that weigh on Lloyd Lara. What's the shocking part is what's out there, what we don't know, what we didn't know growing up, what we played over, you know, and treated as a, as a schoolyard, but not knowing there were bodies there. Lara believes many of the answers lie with the Catholic Church, so we approach them. The Archdiocese here in Regina would not say whether any of the records obtained by CBC News matched or added to documents in its possession. In a statement, the Archdiocese said that it had no information on why the headstones were removed and any records that would help shed light on who is buried in these hundreds of unmarked graves would only be shared with the First Nation. We don't know until we see all the records that the oblates are going to are going to supply you know <clears throat> i also heard you know when they made that statement that there are also some records that they will never declassify you know and are those the ones that they killed those are the ones that died in their care we don't know you know what are they going to give us what are they going to keep when they should be giving everything the work has only begun unearthing this part of history. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Cowessus, First Nation. CBC has a new Indigenous-led team investigating the impacts and harms caused by residential schools. If you have information, tips, or something you want to share, email us, where are they at cbc.ca. We'll be right back. Yes, it is possible to compete with each other, but at the same time to live peacefully together under one roof in an Olympic village. That noble sentiment comes with new logistical challenges during a pandemic. Multiple COVID-19 cases have now been reported in Tokyo's Olympic Village, which will house more than 10,000 competitors. Strict rules mean no parties and no international socializing. But excitement is growing by the day for the games to start and for two of Canada's brightest medal hopes before the pandemic, they were an unstoppable force in beach volleyball. And as they told Andrew, they can't wait to prove they still are. Three, two, one. Their names, Sarah Pavin and Melissa Humana Paredes. Remember them, they are among the very best in beach volleyball and serious contenders in Tokyo. Second ball goes long, Canada! Golden on home stand! Pavin is there! Gold for Canada! Melissa Humana Paredes and Sarah Pavin all on their way to Tokyo! They were on an absolute tear in 2019, winning gold at the World Championships and steamrolling their way into 2020 with a number one world ranking. Then, of course, the pandemic hit and all that momentum evaporated. Sarah and Melissa are finally back on the beach together after spending most of the pandemic in different cities. But the question now, after all that time away from the game and each other, can they regroup in time? I recently caught up with Sarah and Melissa from their training home base in Hermosa Beach, California. So hey, Sarah, Melissa, so nice to, to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to chat. I, I gotta start with the, the challenge of the last year. I mean, can you help me understand just how mentally difficult it would have been for you guys to, I mean, essentially take all of your momentum from the previous season and kind of just put it on hold? I personally went through 
a lot of different emotions. Um, I was angry. I was sad. I was confused. I was in denial. And I just like went through this whole cycle of, of feelings. And eventually, I mean, ended up with acceptance. I don't know if Melissa went through exactly the same process, but yeah, I definitely went through a similar emotional roller coaster. I think most of us did. Um, I came back to Canada kind of as soon as there was talk about closing of the borders between the US and Canada. And um, I spent the majority of the pandemic in Victoria. That was also very unexpected. I packed a carry-on because I thought I was going to be gone for two weeks. And I was there for Ever. months. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go shopping a lot. Um, but yeah, it, it it wasn't what I expected. Like neither of us. We, it was like, bye Sarah, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. This will be fine. Yeah. And it wasn't fine. <laughs> I think it's starting to get to me a little bit. Um, I'm starting to get a little antsy. It's tough. This is tough. Unlike their competitors, Melissa and Sarah spent the pandemic off the beach and away from each other. Their Olympic prep, a lot of strength training, alone. We didn't touch a volleyball. Um, it's the longest we've ever gone. Away from each other and away from the sport. None of our other competitors really were away from their teammates for this long or like in a different country, like not able to train. Like we would, it would be really hard to like not compare ourselves and be like, oh my gosh, we're going to be so far behind because look at all of our competitors. They're still able to be with each other and work and do this. And I'm stuck in a living room trying to like lift a couple dumbbells um, and try and maintain the strength that I put on for the Olympics. And I have no idea when the Olympics are going to happen or if they're going to happen. And it was, it was really difficult. It was, um, yeah, it was so hard. <laughs> Just understanding that we are both moving through emotions and feelings in a different way or a similar way. And just like being able to be vulnerable and real with each other in where we are mentally and physically. And I think having that kind of relationship and honesty and openness um, and safety is what allowed us to move through it in our own way at our own pace. And tell me about those moments where you are together. I mean, so I've seen lots of the two of you in competition. And I got to say, you know, Melissa, w when I see you make a really great play, I'm actually watching Sarah's face. And in those moments after you make a great play, I'll see Sarah, I'll see you mouth the words, great job. That's how we do it. Melissa, I mean, you're nodding your head as I say all of that. What? what do you see and what do you hear in those moments? Yeah. And it's funny when I, when I do rewatch some of those games and some of those plays, I, I do the same thing. Like after I, if I made a game, I look at Sarah and I look at her reaction and it's, it gives me a lot of joy and kind of a lot of confidence and just like, um, it just makes me really giddy because I know we, you know, as a team, we have really high standards. And so when I see that emotion from her, and, and when I see her kind of be proud of something that I did, it makes me want to do it again and more because it's just, I think those moments are what brings us together. And those are the moments that we kind of like play for those little words that are said, like while we're hugging in between points, like those are the moments where I think that brings us closer together. Sarah, is, is Melissa reading you right there? Yes. <laughs> no, I am like, I enjoy seeing Melissa succeed. And yeah, I am proud of her when she does great things. And I'm glad that she could know that. <laughs> um, yeah, I am definitely more stoic. So to be able to know that she feels that from me is, is amazing because I know like when it's in reverse, she is very excited and happy and like it can't I I giggle when she like responds in that way because it's just so cute but so like we celebrate each other in different ways but I think the base sentiment is the same of just like pride and joy and like so much excitement that like she's on my team you know I gotta say you sound like a real family we are you have to be <laughs> like it like this journey makes you really connect on a really deep level like like there's no other better word i think than family casting ahead to to 
the Olympics uh, and expectations. What are they? I think, you know, they've been the same for a little bit now and it's to go into Tokyo and be on top of the podium. Um, I think all we can ask for ourselves is to be able to produce Olympic gold medal worthy performances at the Olympics. And if we do that, then the outcome will be an Olympic gold medal. And I think we're on the right path. And that is what we're looking for. Sarah, Melissa, I wish you all the best. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in Tokyo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And stay with CBC for all the Olympic action from Tokyo, starting with the opening ceremony this Friday, hosted by Adrian and Olympic Prime Times Scott Russell. Coverage starts at 6.30 a.m. Eastern on CBC TV, CBC News Network, and CBC Gem. Also starting this Friday, be sure to watch The National on CBC News Network. Up next, we continue our countdown to the Olympics with a look at a team that may not be on your radar. It is up to us to put in good performances when the eyes of the world are on us. What Canada's men's field hockey team wants you to know about them and their sport. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, journalist Julie K. Brown on Ghislaine Maxwell's upcoming trial and her bombshell investigation into Jeffrey Epstein's 2008 plea deal that brought global attention to the case. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In Tokyo, Team Canada is set to be represented by 371 athletes. Our colleagues at CBC Sports cover these men and women year in, year out as they make their Olympic journey. Over the coming days, we'll introduce you to some of them. And we'll start tonight with Canada's men's field hockey team. My parents' philosophy was basically to throw their kids into as many sports as possible. I played all sorts of sports growing up. Soccer, ice hockey, basketball. Your lucky ended up being the natural progression. The rest is history. It's not a very popular sport in Canada, but around the world it is quite well known. It's Canada's other hockey. You're Canadian playing hockey. And then you mentioned field hockey. Usually you usually get a bit of a laugh in your face, something like that. For us, that's no problem. We're, we're ready to roll with that. It's an ever-evolving sport. They're never just set on the rules. 11 aside, we've got the best parts of soccer and the best parts of ice hockey. It's amazingly skillful, it's amazingly fast. And it's exciting to play. And we're hoping to throw the profile a little bit around here. The only time you guys would really hear about us is during a, an Olympic cycle, and we've been fortunate enough to qualify for the last two. You've got such a discrepancy between the number of athletes that you have to choose from and what some might characterize as an overperformance. But you know what? It's hard to say that it's a fluke or a team overperforming when we do it consistently. We know the better we do at a major games, the higher the profile is going to be, and hopefully the more kids are going to start playing. So it is up to us to put in good performances when the eyes of the world are on us. We don't have the same financial support as some of the other sports. Some of the guys on our team have jobs outside of, of what we do uh, here on the pitch. We are there strictly because we love the sport and we want to see the sport grow in Canada, and we want to play at the highest level that we possibly can. I'm just excited about the opportunity, excited to put that red shirt on. And I'm excited to watch them now. Next on the National, keeping cool in Red Deer, Alberta. The kids really, really love it. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, our firefighters really, really love it. How this fire department is helping their community beat the heat. Our moment is next. Welcome back. Much of Western Canada has been having a hot summer and in Red Deer, Alberta, creative fire department staff are helping the community cool off. Have a look at why it's been a big hit for the firefighters and residents alike in our moment. 
we spend a lot of time serving the community and this is a really really good opportunity for us to come out and uh, see them in more of a, a social setting really as opposed to uh, our normal day-to-day -day responses that we do. Being able to see our emergency services crew in a positive light, a lot of the times when we see them it's in, a, in the sense of emergency so it's really great when we're able to see them when they're not an emergency. They're able to um, interact with the, with the residents and it's just a, it's just a great opportunity for everyone. It's been pretty successful I would say. The kids really really love it and uh, you know quite frankly our firefighters really really love it too. It's, it's fun for everybody because uh, they get to come out here, they get to spray some water, the kids get to play under it. Uh, we get to see the joy on the faces of the kids and, and really engage with the community. I remember years ago seeing pictures from, I think, New York City, but at least some places in the States where they'd open up fire hydrants when it got really hot. But using the fire truck seems like next level fun. And by the way, the forecast for Red Deer tomorrow, it's going to feel like 26 degrees in the afternoon with smoky haze in the sky. So perfect conditions for more water. That is the National for July the 19th. Good night.